Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, John F. Kennedy, Tony Robbins, Michael Phelps, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of industries. What else do they have in common? Well, they all have ADHD, but you don't hear much about that, do you? You know what you hear even less about? The successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm an attorney, not a doctor, a lifelong student, not a coach. I'm also the creator of Cortography, a patent pending system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your superpowers, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest superpowers. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka. Welcome to episode 23 of ADHD for Smartass Women. And in this episode, we are going to talk all about rumination. So our ADHD, it makes us so creative and vividly imaginative. It also gives us this incredible ability to hyperfocus. But the problem is that bad is always bigger than good, meaning it's stickier than good, right? Our brains remember the negative thoughts more readily than positive thoughts. And I think that's people in general, the prehistoric part of our brain that wants to protect us from danger. It's constantly going to be flaring up and saying, you know, danger. Was it Will Rogers? Danger, danger, that little part of our brain. But for those of us with ADHD, you know, we're scanners, right? One of the features of our ADHD brains is on top of all this, we're constantly scanning the horizon. So what can happen is that stickier part of our brain where bad is always stickier than good, it can be even bigger. And so what ends up happening and the reason this happens is because we can hyperfocus and hyperfocusing is not always good. Hyperfocusing can be bad, right? We can be hyperfocusing on negative things. And this is rumination. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you are really excited because you have a date with this gentleman that you've been so excited to meet. You've been talking to him a lot. You have friends that are in common and you really think, okay, this sounds like a really good potential relationship. So you get to wherever it is that you're meeting for your date, let's say a restaurant. And, you know, you're supposed to meet at seven o'clock. It's now 7.05. So he's five minutes late. And so what you do is you just automatically assume the worst. This must be that you've been rejected. You know, you don't think about the fact that, well, maybe he's just late. Uh, Maybe traffic was bad. Or maybe he also has ADHD and he put this in his calendar for tomorrow, not tonight. What your brain starts to do is you disastertize, you catastrophize. You've got this hyperactivity of the mind, right? And you also have this ability to hyperfocus. You're very creative. And as far as what you're thinking about, what you're coming up with. So while you're sitting there waiting, suddenly your mind goes to the boyfriend that broke up with you in college for whatever reason he told you that probably isn't even true. And then you move on to the promotion that you didn't get last month. And then, of course, you remember you weren't invited to be a bridesmaid in a friend's wedding that you just found out about a week ago, forget that you weren't really that good friends of her and you weren't really a good friend of hers. And she really didn't have bridesmaids, right? She just had a maid of honor. You think that one of your friends has been acting differently. So it must be that she's mad at you. You must have done something again. And then from there, you head over to that teacher in third grade who never gave you student of the month. Now, everyone in your life is rejecting you and you're a total loser. So from someone being five minutes late for a date, that's where you've come. And that's what rumination feels like. So ruminating, this word derives from the Latin term for chewing cud. So it's basically, you know, cows, they grind up their feed, they swallow it, and then they regurgitate it, and then they rechew their feed. 
it's kind of disgusting, isn't it? It's this style of thinking that you've developed over time where you're like a hamster on a hamster wheel. You're running, you're running, you're running, but you're getting nowhere. You're obsessing about a past problem, a past loss, any kind of setback, but you just keep thinking about it over and over and you never move forward to action. And since you do nothing about it, except for sitting there and thinking about it, nothing changed. So your problem remains unsolved. And so what ultimately happens is you just start feeling worse and worse about it and about yourself. When you ruminate, you deal repetitively on negative thoughts. Remember as well, you know, when we have ADHD, we also have a problem with transitions, right? We have a problem moving on and changing our thought or what it is that we're working on. So we have problems stopping and starting. So guess what happens when we start ruminating? Yeah, we can't stop. And as you ruminate, you actually deepen those grooves in your brain which control your fight or flight response. That in turn increases your levels of cortisol. And cortisol, of course, is that big bad stress hormone. Ruminating is also lonely because you're cutting yourself off from other people. You can be dissecting conversations and attributing ill will to friends that they never intended this at all, but that's what you think. And the reason this is so serious is that this tendency to overthink, it's linked to overeating, it's linked to alcoholism, it's linked to depression, it's linked to anxiety and insomnia and high blood pressure. It's not good. So why do people ruminate? Well, believe it or not, or why do those of us with ADHD ruminate would be a better question, wouldn't it? Believe it or not, it focuses our minds and it provides mental stimulation. So it's basically the brain's way of entertaining itself. Who ruminates? Well, it's no surprise that it's primarily women. And part of this is how we're socialized. But part of it is also biology. Women tend to care more about relationships, so they tend to analyze them more. Men tend to want to act even before they've thought their problems through. So this also may be why women suffer from depression more than men do. Now, what I've said from the beginning of starting this podcast group and, of course, starting my Facebook group, ADHD for Smartass Women, my intention is never to teach because I feel like, you know, we are all in this learning together. And there's so much that I don't know about ADHD that I want to learn. And I find that I learn most from women who struggle with it as I have struggled with it and still struggle with it. So I did a bunch of research on rumination. And the reason I had to do so much research is because this is one area, you know, our brains are all different, right? So what works for you won't work for me. My ADHD brain is wired differently than your ADHD brain is. And I don't really struggle with rumination. And in fact, what I say all the time is I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. I tend to be more like my male friends. I jump right to action. What can we do? And I think I'm can be quite irritating to a lot of my women friends because, you know, my whole MO is, okay, let's stop talking about this and let's act. I think I have this intensity and this drivenness and that's how I challenge it. I'm very action oriented. And a lot of times women, what they want to do is they want to meet and talk about it versus I'm always looking for solutions. I also think that the reason I do think I had a propensity to rumination, but I think what kind of nipped it in the bud is I made a really good decision about marrying my husband. I have never been insecure about our relationship. I often look at him and think, why are you so nice? You know, because if I had to live with me, I'd be kind of irritated. You know, I do struggle with timeliness. I have no sense of time. I'm late a lot. I am impulsive in my speech and my thought patterns, but he's just really, really great. I mean, I think that daily he will make comments about like all my positives. You know, he is not the kind of person to point out my negatives. And I can be very critical. I think I am much more apt to point out negatives than he is. And I don't know why that is, but bottom line, I found the right guy. So because of that, because there is never insecurity about my relationship with my husband and the fact that he is always so apt to point out my positives, I think that really nipped 
that rumination that I think I had a propensity to develop, I think it nipped it in the bud. Because I do recall when I was younger, a friend commented that I overanalyzed relationships. And when I think back, I think that that was true. The other part of me, too, is I've always loved analyzing other people's relationships. And I am fascinated by female relationships. So anyway, my point is simply that I really had to go to my group and I had to ask them, okay, what is this thing rumination? What does this feel like to you? And I could identify it, but I didn't really struggle with it. So I needed to get them to weigh in. So anyway, over time, when you're talking about ruminating, this focus on the negative makes you even more sensitive to more negativity, right? So negativity begets more negativity. It's that age old adage that what we focus on just gets bigger. And I think about a friend of mine who is just brilliant and, you know, she's a CEO, she's very accomplished, but she just has this propensity to ruminate and to view her life through everything that is negative. So she just has this attitude that if anybody's going to get screwed, it's me. And I hate to even say that because it just bothers me. But the problem is everything that happens in her life, she views through this, I'm going to get screwed lens. So she can't even see all the incredible positive things that happen in her life every single day. She doesn't see all the times things have worked so well for her. So when you're ruminating, it's all about a preoccupation with you. You're focusing on the self and the whole world is revolving around you. And I think that we tend to do this more when we're younger. It's harder to do it once we have kids because we just have less time to focus on ourselves. But it also may come back once the kids are out of the nest, because again, we have more time for ourselves. And certainly if you believe that your purpose was your children and now they're gone, you know, you can see how the ruminating can rear its ugly head once again. Worse yet, when we're ruminating, we often don't even realize we were ruminating. We actually think we're problem solving. And this is the key. If you think that you're problem solving, but it doesn't lead to specific action, guess what? It's rumination. And you have to agree with me that there's got to be a better way or a better use for your creativity and imagination than ruminating. You know, we hyper focus. So there's definitely also something just so much more positive that we could be hyper focusing on. It's not a good thing. You know, it makes us feel really bad about ourselves. And it's also a waste of life. Now, so how do we stop ruminating now that we know what it is? Well, we're notoriously poor observers of ourself. You know, oftentimes we're still shocked when we hear very positive comments about us, right? We tend to forget what our strengths are because, again, the bad is stickier than good. So we kind of automatically gravitate towards all the things that we don't do right. So we forget about what our strengths are. Often we're not even aware that we're ruminating. So the first thing you can do is you can ask your friends and your family, do I obsess and ruminate over problems, over making decisions? Do I ruminate and, you know, obsess over relationships and listen to what it is that they say and then ask them for examples. The second thing we can do is we can start to notice our thoughts. We have a wonderful woman in our Facebook group. Her name's Caitlin Mabry, and she actually works with my son as well. And she's a reading specialist, and she also has ADHD. And so she taught my son all about metacognition. And metacognition is thinking about what you're thinking about. You can learn how to notice your negative thoughts and negative self-talk. Apparently, we have 60,000 thoughts a day. And most of them aren't positive. So we need to learn that don't believe everything you think. Martha Beck was talking about rumination. You know, what you do when you're thinking about what you're thinking about when you're using metacognition is you're just watching your thoughts pass through like clouds that pass in the sky. You're not judging them. You're not engaging them. You're just noticing them. Then what you're going to do is you're going to label the thought. So if you have a thought that is a negative thought, you're going to say, I'm ruminating, I'm worrying, that's me just obsessing. Now, the difference between ruminating is you're talking about something or you're thinking about something that occurred in your past versus if you're worrying, you're thinking about something in your future. And whether it's ruminating, whether it's worrying, whether it's bad self-talk, what you do is you give the ruminating a name. And you say something like, shut up, Millie, 
shut up, Susan. You literally talk to it and tell it to stop. Now, we have a woman in our group, Fran, who's lovely. And what she does when she can feel, you know, she knows that she's ruminating, she just found this word and the word is sassafras. And it was so old fashioned that it just made her laugh. And so what happens is when she starts noticing that she's ruminating, she says sassafras. And she said it makes her laugh every time. So what is she doing when she says sassafras? Well, she's using that word to force herself to pause. And she's changing that negative emotion that she's feeling to a positive emotion because she's now laughing and she's stopping the ruminating in its tracks. What else can we do? Well, action is actually the antidote to rumination. So me feeling like I'm a man trapped in a woman's body, that's exactly what I'm doing. I am using action to stop the rumination. So you can make a decision and do something, anything to move the decision that you made forward. You need to act. You know, you've created this whole story in your mind, but we really don't know that it's true. It is likely not true. And the only antidote to actually, number one, figuring out if it's true and to stop the ruminating that's going on in your brain, the only antidote is action. So ask yourself, what can I actually do about this? Then you can write a list of specific steps that you can take to move forward in what you're ruminating about. Look, if you can't change the outcome, ask yourself, what can I learn from what happened in the past that can now help me in my future? Look, I don't believe in failure. There's no such thing in my mind as failure. You either succeed or you learn. And I'm going to tell you a story of something that happened to me in my late 20s, maybe it was early 30s, that really changed my whole idea on what I thought failure was or wasn't. So I had a women's wear line and the women's wear line sold in Saks, Neiman's and Nordstrom. 60% of our business was those big box stores. But the other 40% was smaller high-end boutiques. Some of them were abroad and some of them were here in the United States. And there was the small boutique, and I can never remember where it was, but I think it was in the city that they hold the Kentucky Derby. And they were really a highly respected boutique. And I really wanted to get my garments into that store. And I worked really hard to do that. When I was out in New York at the Fashion Coterie, I met the owner of the store and we just immediately took a liking to each other. And I just, he was so professional and he was so kind and I just really respected him. So I was delighted when we finally got an order from him. Well, I don't know what happened, but I somehow from getting the order in New York City to getting home and getting into my office, the order just fell by the wayside. I ended up putting it into our production. Honestly, I had a really bad production manager and she just lost the order. It never got into her books. So six weeks later, two months later, I get a letter from the store that they are canceling their order for non-delivery. And I panicked. I was like, how could this possibly happen? We missed our delivery date. And initially I panicked and I thought, okay, well, there's nothing I can do. We're screwed. I made a mistake. You know, bottom line, the buck stops with me. It doesn't matter what my production manager did or didn't do. It's my fault. And then I sat down and I thought about, and I asked myself this question, what could I do to disrupt how the situation was typically handled in the industry? And I decided to do something that no one would typically do. No, no vendor of, of garments. And so I called up the owner of the boutique and I said, this was totally my fault. I don't know where the slip up was, but I am mortified. I know you put our trust in us. I know this completely screws up your numbers when you place orders and you expect garments to be on your floor at a certain time. And then the vendor doesn't deliver. And I know this happens more often than it should. And I am just mortified. So this is what I'm going to do. I am going to cut and sew your order right now. We're going to deliver it within the next week. We're going to put a rush on it. We are not going to charge you a penny for it. So this is what happened. The boutique owner was so blown away because he told me in 40 years, no one had ever done this, not one vendor. And he was so blown away that he was not canceling the order. He was going to pay us the money and he was going to tell everybody that he knows what he had done once the garments got to his floor. Now, 
That literally changed my definition of failure. And what it did is it made me understand that when something bad happens, that is almost the best off. In fact, I think it's a better opportunity than if I had delivered the product and the product was beautiful. The fact that I got in there and shook up the normal MO, the status quo of what normally happens in a situation like this versus, you know, where the vendor just kind of doesn't <laughs> respond and slinks away and you never hear from, you know, that vendor again. The fact that I was willing to do something different, the fact that I was willing to basically challenge the status quo of how this has normally happened, it taught me that every time something happens that isn't good, that it's not the way I wish it would have happened, that, you know, it's what most people would consider a failure. That is an opportunity more than any other to get in there and wow who it is that you're working with and make things even better than they had been before the glitch or the problem or the failure. So I don't see failure as failure at all. The definition of failing for me is learning. It's how to make things better. And that's just how I approach every air quote failure in life today. His reaction to my response, it literally changed how I approach everything in my life. And I have to tell you, for those of us with inattentive ADHD, you know, this failure is also when we should most use our impulsiveness if we have it. Because when we jump to something, to a reaction without overthinking it, you're as close to your intuition as you will ever get, you know, and typically we've been talked out of using our intuition. You know, we've been talked into using stats and numbers and figures and facts. And I have to tell you, my response to that boutique owner made no sense. Nobody in their right mind would react in that way. But the reality of it was I did. That was my intuition. I didn't overthink it. I jumped and that's how I was going to handle it. And what ended up happening was his response back to me and our relationship was better than had it never happened before. So I was trusting my intuition. So again, for those of you with inattentive ADHD, again, I'm combined type. I'm very hyperactive. So I didn't overthink it, right? I was impulsive. But for those of you with inattentive ADHD, you will likely be less impulsive. So you'll get in your head and you'll start, you know, feeding yourself a line that you'll overthink it. You know, no, you should not react with your intuition. You should not listen to your intuition because it wouldn't make financial sense to do this because of numbers, figures, facts. So I hope I made that clear. Okay. So what else can we do? Well, there is a fabulous ADHD coach. Her name's Barbara Luther, and she's head of training for ADCA, which ADCA is the ADD Coaching Academy. And what she does is she gives her clients five minutes of BMW time at the start of each session. What's BMW time? It's bitch moment wine time. So she lets her clients complain and ruminate and talk all about everything that's wrong for five minutes. But by the end of the five minutes, they have to start working on a plan of action. You know, and she said she used to give them more time, but what she realized, it just made them feel worse. And that's exactly what happens when we ruminate, right? We feel worse and worse about the problem. We don't feel better. So if you're thinking about a problem for more than five minutes, just know that you're probably a ruminator. And again, I'm going to say whatever you focus on just gets bigger and bigger. So start focusing on the positive things. Now, the great thing about our ADHD brains is many of us are pretty distractible. You know, granted, we all have different brains, but most of us with ADHD were distractible. And I always laugh and I say, you know, I'm the best person to get angry at, or I am the best person to make angry because I may get really upset and I may think about the problem. I may ruminate about the problem for a few minutes, but then I lose it. And sometimes I feel in my body that I'm upset, but I can't remember what I'm upset about. Like I have to get back into my body to remember why I was so upset. So we can use this distractibility. We can learn how to distract our brain in a positive way. When you start noticing yourself ruminating, switch to action to disrupt it. You know, there was a 2015 study that found that going for a walk in nature reduces rumination because it creates positive emotions. Now, you know, this doesn't work in a city or an urban environment. You need to be outside in nature. So, you know, you have to be in a park or a garden. And, you know, one of the things that really works for me, and it's surprising, another thing I should say, is gardening. 
When I am out in a garden, I don't know why it is, but my brain stops working. I am out there and it's just positive emotion and I don't ruminate. I don't think about things. I am outside of my thoughts and I don't know why that is except for I'm in nature. Exercise is another brilliant way to reduce rumination. When you start exercising, that's another way that I can stop my brain from thinking. Now, there are a lot of runners with ADHD and they use running to manage their ADHD, but be careful because some people use running to ruminate. They can run and be thinking through their thoughts at the same time. But for a lot of us, when we run, it actually clears our mind and it clears our thoughts. What are other ways that we can distract our brain? We can listen to music. We can cook. I don't know why cooking works, but cooking works for a lot of us. This was one of the suggestions that a woman in our Facebook group had. Going to a movie works. But for me, I have to actually be physically in a movie where it's completely dark and I can't be focused on anything else. Then I can absolutely focus on the movie and I can distract my brain. You can meet a friend, but you need to only talk about whatever it is that's upsetting you for five minutes. Again, our brains are all different. You have to test what works for you. Okay, what else can work? We can focus on a goal. We can set a goal and meet a goal. When we do something that we really love and we're passionate about, guess what happens? We increase the dopamine in our brain. That in turn dissipates feel good emotion in ourselves. And then we are less apt to ruminate. So once you feel good, then you're able to kind of follow that good feeling and keep ratcheting it up by focusing on your goals, setting your goals, meeting your goals. So again, we're talking about action. And when we are acting, we are less apt to ruminate. I've also noticed that I'm able to manage my mood. We're again in the acting doing category, but I'm able to manage my mood by doing scary stuff that I really want to do. And I've told this story before, hopefully not to excess. But, you know, in my online business, I knew that I had to get comfortable on live video, but I was petrified of live video. Just the whole idea of not being able to see who was out there. You know, I'm fine speaking in public. In fact, I love to do it. But when I was on live video, I didn't know who my audience was, so I couldn't feed off of their energy. But what I realized is, you know, once I started to do that, which petrified me live video, I noticed that after I got off of live video, It was the best feeling because I was making myself proud. And so by doing what I was scared to do, but really wanted to do, I naturally increased the dopamine in my brain. And I learned from that, that I can affect my mood internally by acting, by doing that, which I really want to do, but I'm either procrastinating about, or I'm fearful of doing, you know, all the reasons why we can't do what we can do. My mood, I learned, was a direct reflection of what I was doing or what I wasn't doing. Now, how else can you stop yourself from ruminating? You can focus on someone else and their problems. You can volunteer. You can help other people. And the reason that works is because you're not focusing on yourself. You're focusing on them. One other suggestion that I found that I thought was really interesting, and I haven't tried it yet, but I'm going to, is you can play a mind game with yourself. So let's say something happens and you're really upset about it and you're starting to ruminate. You're in your car and you're driving. Okay. So you're out and about. What you can do is pick a color and try to spot things in that color. So let's say your color is yellow. So what you focus your mind on so that you can stop the ruminating is look for all the cars you can find and all the buildings and anything out there that you can spot that's in that color yellow. Because what is happening is your mind is so preoccupied by looking for that color yellow that you can't ruminate. What works for a lot of people is meditation and mindfulness training. You know, problem solving remember, requires thought and taking action. You need an equal balance of thought and action. You do need to think. You need to think through the problem, but then you also need to take action about the problem. Now, the opposite problem would be someone who's impulsive. They have the hyperactive form of ADHD, so they don't think at all. They just act. And that's not good either, right? It's more like men. They keep making the same bad decisions over and over, and then they're like in Groundhog Day. So that's what I have to tell you about rumination. That's what I have for you for this week. As always, you are listening to 
ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you've been listening to me for a while, I would really appreciate a review. It is not hard to do. You don't even have to write anything. All you have to do is go to the iTunes podcast platform, scroll down to the bottom, and you can click on the stars. That's all you have to do. If you'd like to know more about me, our patent pending cartography system that teaches you how to figure out which of the many interests you should actually pursue, or if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, go to my website at tracyotsuka.com. You can click on the podcast in the navigation bar, and you will see a microphone to your right where you can leave me an audio message. You can also reach out to me at tracy at tracyotsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you liked what you heard, we sure would appreciate a review. And not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, well, that's also the name of our free Facebook group. Go look it up. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. We'd love to have you join us. You can also find all my details over at tracyoutsuka.com. Don't forget, I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week. <laughs>